back for you tonight. Ideology is the root cause of evil. Evil, call them ISIS, call them Al-Qaeda, Hamas, or what have you. It's the idea that's the problem. David Cameron knows it. When will President Obama? Oh, and let's talk Turkey. We have to use their bases to attack ISIS, but it comes with a price against the Kurds and a whole lot of other sketchy stuff. My good friend, Israeli relations expert Philippe Azzeline, was invited on Iranian TV to talk about it, but in just a moment, he's here with me. It's not Muslims that are the problem, but maybe it's the core of Islam that is. What would make someone do this in the name of religion? I'm going to go ahead and say it. They don't think like we do. All Muslims? No, but the ideology behind it, behind that video, something ain't right. Joining me now with his analysis is really Israeli relations expert Philippe Azeline. Philippe, great to see you tonight. Good to see you too, Tommy. All right, Philippe, is ideology the problem here? Why are some Muslims, most Muslims, peaceful and others willing to do the kind of thing we just saw in that video? Well, there's a core uh, set of values that one interpretation of Islam has that is incompatible with everything we hold dear. Uh, it originated in Saudi Arabia and places around it. It's been exported by oil money for 20, 30 years now. And what you saw in that video and what is in the rest of the video is an alarming case of people indoctrinating young children to kill themselves so that they can kill, quote, infidels and go to heaven and seek martyrdom and all these things that appeal to children. And then what happens is it breeds a cycle. When those children end up resorting to violence or being in places where there's terrorism and get killed tragically, that's used as victimhood and it fuels the same cycle. There is a core of one version of Islam. I don't think it's necessarily the authentic one at all, but it draws on authentic texts and it is promoting hatred and violence. It's so confusing to me because I wonder, what do we do? How do we combat that? We see the indoctrination from such a young age. We know that they're brought up to think this way, to feel this way. So how do we put ourselves in that picture, try to win the hearts and minds of people that clearly don't think like we do? Well, it's the greatest question. It's the most important question. And unfortunately, it's just starting to be asked now. How would you educate if you had, you know, God forbid, a cousin or a nephew or somebody who went into a bad direction, was believing terrible things, maybe joined a gang? The first thing you do is try to talk them out of it. You try to show them an alternative and you try to show them that their understanding of how the world works is wrong. We haven't done that. We've done the opposite. Rather than promoting the imams, and there are a lot of authentic religious scholars who can teach Muslim kids a different way of applying their religion, this administration and a lot of Western governments have been rewarding the ones who promote jihad in this hope that that will make them more moderate. So instead of fighting Iran, we're rewarding Iran. And success breeds success. And the, the problem here as well is, and I've said it so many times, but when you don't call it radical Islam, when you say that these are just a few extreme people, but it's not a few extreme people. You've seen it firsthand. It's not a few. It's a lot of people that think this way. Not all, but quite a few. So when you won't call it radical Islam, when you won't say that, yes, there is a segment of the Muslim population that is a problem, when you won't go ahead and say that, then you can't address the problem because you're just trying to sweep it under the rug. I have a problem with that, and that's why I preach it so often. It's not a hateful message. It's a message of, I want hope. I want a chance for peace. I don't see it coming from this administration. But I want to move on now, Philippe, to something else that's important to me, is what's going on in the Middle East right now? Because it doesn't seem like we have a strategy yet. Now we're trying to use Turkish bases to go after ISIS, but there could be some problems arising from that as well. Can you explain for us? Yeah, the uh, Middle East is teetering more than I can remember in, in many, many years. You know, it's a perfect case of when the cat's away, the mice will play. So you have ISIS now emerging in the Sinai, in Gaza, in Turkey. You have Turkey taking advantage of the ISIS situation. And it came out this week that the Turkish government, contrary to the wishes of the vast majority of Turkish people, is supporting ISIS and now making some deal with the Americans, with this administration to, to use bases. But they're going to use that deal to attack the Kurds. Iran is rising. It's supporting fundamentalist groups. I don't see a policy. If there is one, it's a very long game and it's a very uh, unsure bet. 
And we're talking about Turkey actually potentially supporting ISIS and then having us in some kind of a skirmish. We were originally we were supporting the Kurds, and now you're saying if we help the Turks, then we're going to actually disadvantage the Kurds. So to me, it's we have to be very careful who we're arming, who we're supporting here, because if we're not careful, we're going to arm the enemy. Well, I think no matter what happens, any weapons that go to the Middle East, a portion of them is going to turn on the West and on us one day. That's just the way it is. It's what happened with Afghanistan in the 80s. Uh, Turkey is much more concerned with the Kurds. They have Kurdish militias and terrorist groups that have been attacking them for decades. They're threatened by Kurdish separatism in their territory and on the border, and that's their priority. And if ISIS is the way to fight them back and fight Assad, they'll use ISIS. If the Americans give them a, a better deal, they'll go with the Americans. But the Kurds, the, at least these militias, who are the ones fighting ISIS, are going to suffer. And you mentioned something to me earlier, and we were speaking about this before the show, that this is all some sort of a plot with oil as well. Oil is involved in all this. We know that when we're talking about the Middle East, it is, but it's bigger than just Islam. It's also about oil and money. So what do we do in that situation? Those two always go together. So first of all, the oil money from Qatar and Saudi Arabia until recently was, was being used to fund these ideologies everywhere. Started in Afghanistan, went into the rest of the Middle East, turned peaceful Islam into desert, violent Islam. But there's also a very ugly fact, and it points to how much of a cesspool the Middle East can be. Assad of Syria let ISIS take Syrian oil and sell it. The Turks bought some of this oil, according to recent reports, funding ISIS for their own reasons. For the, Kurd, for the Turks, it was fighting the Kurds. For Assad, it was looking like there's somebody worse than him, literally funding the Islamists so he can look like the moderate, which is what Turkey, which is what Iran is enjoying now. This is a pattern in Middle Eastern history. They do it all the time. So oil is extremely important in this, in this fight. And in fact, the Kurds are also trying to sell their oil, but nobody will buy it except the Israelis bought it once and maybe the Turks, ironically, trying to gain influence, bought it once, I think. It's so confusing we talk about it because even, you know, sitting here in San Diego and California for Americans to look at this, it seems like it's so confusing. We don't know where all the puzzle pieces align here, but we have heard it from the mainstream media as well as the Obama administration that Iran is against ISIS, that potentially they could be our partner against ISIS. But I wonder how long is it going to be until we see Iran backing ISIS and it's no longer a mystery here. We've, we've seen them all in cahoots. It's a great, great question again, and I, I wonder why people don't ask this. Syria's Assad is Iran. He doesn't do anything without Iran say so. He, in Syria, was supporting ISIS, even though they're going to fight him. He freed ISIS people. That means Iran was okay with it, because it makes him look like the moderate. So Iran is fighting ISIS in Iraq, because it wants to take over Iraq. It is not necessarily fighting ISIS in Syria, and if it has, it's been very recently and through Hezbollah. It is, as you're saying, extremely confusing, a lot of dirty games, and the only common denominator here is that you have one extremist version of Islam facing off against another. But it's all the same ideology. That's the problem here. I, I've said on my show before, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So at the end of the day, we know where they align. And it's not with Israel, and it's not with the United States. In fact, I spoke about this a couple days ago with a former Navy SEAL, my friend Jonathan Gillum. We were discussing how there's a document that was just revealed, an ISIS recruitment document that said, hey, we want something broader here. We actually want and it, not only just the caliphate, we want to unite the world's Muslims, have an extreme brand of Islam. We want to unite everyone and basically have an end of the world. Now, it seems extreme, but I wonder how long until we're going to start seeing this in action. This is the end game of ISIS. It's actually the present game of ISIS. ISIS is different from the other extremist groups in that it wants to do the same thing, but now. And fighting everybody at the same time is not a problem for it. It's what it wants, because that's how it interprets what Mohammed and the first armies after him did. They were fighting the Byzantines and they were fighting the Persians at the same time. They want to fight everybody. And again, success breeds success. And they're tapping into a base of what the, the Saudi and Qatari money exported for years. Now you're talking about getting into nukes. They're going to get access to nukes maybe in India. We down drones and destroy them or black op helicopters when they fall in enemy territory so that jihadists won't get that technology. And yet now we're letting Iran keep 
nuclear technology. Imagine if that country becomes destabilized because of ISIS or a group like that. That's the threat. This is what's so important for people to pay attention to. Wake up. This is not a conspiracy theory. Don't let them tell you this. Don't let the Obama administration and everyone else tell you that we shouldn't be worried about this. We need to be worried about this. This is the time to pay attention. Philippe, it's coming from you. You've got the experience in the Middle East coming from me sitting here in San Diego at 22 years old. We need to understand this. Everyone needs to understand this. Thank you for being here tonight.